Hello and welcome to this edition of 101 with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. I'm Lorna Virgili and thank you for watching. Hello Mr. Leggett, how are you? Very well, how are you today? Very well. Um, first, before we get started, it's been quite some time since we um, taped this show and I want to ask you, how are you? Because you oh. went under the knife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went under the knife for the second time in about six months. I've had uh, two back surgeries over the last two months. A problem called Steiner stenosis, and they adjusted one problem about six months ago. And unfortunately, uh, we had a second problem to occur, or at least to become much worse far, far sooner than they anticipated. And so, uh, just a week and a half ago, I had the second surgery. So, the recovery takes a little bit of time, and so we've adjusted the schedule. So, I'm probably now what we would consider a normal schedule for most people because the schedule prior, prior to now was really probably equivalent of two schedules, but I'm um, back down to what we consider a fairly normal schedule at this point. Well, I have to say that you look a lot healthier <laughs> and you look happier. Thank so you. it seems like this one did work out for you. <laughs> well, the last one worked out well, but uh, what happened after about six months is a problem of different area. And so you can't take the first month or two for granted to assume that everything is okay. So after another month or so, I'll see whether or not this has worked as well as we anticipated. Well, congratulations. We're Thank all you. glad that uh, you're doing well. Thank you. Let's talk about uh, the FY17 operating budget that was approved by County Council. You extended the congratulations and, and gratitude to the members of Council, but you did mention that you were concerned, and here's your statement, statement saying that they increase spending above your recommendation by $27 million and also increased property tax for county residents an average of an additional $84. Well, let me first of all congratulate the council and council president Nancy Florine for some very hard work on some difficult circumstances and conditions. I congratulate them first of all recognizing that we need to have additional resources and taxes. I congratulate them for recognizing also the need for our school system that we truly needed to provide additional revenues for our school. As you may recall, I provided an additional $90 million over the maintenance of effort level, really about $133 million overall from last year's amount. Uh, this in recognition of the tremendous growth and the challenges, the over, uh, large size classrooms that we have in our school system, some of the disparities that we have in our school system we need to address. But the problem for me, uh, when you look at budgets, you need to look at them in multiple years and as opposed to one year. Uh, one year will not give you a true picture and one year has an impact, a role and impact on following years. And as you look at the current budget, I suggested that we not go above the spending levels that I've suggested, not only this year but last year as well. And there's a cumulative effect of what happens with that. Number one, uh, you build in large amounts of uh, spending that are ongoing expenditures and you must address those. And we recognize, I recognize that we've exercised virtually all of the options that we've had that would have allowed us in the past to address those concerns. For example, we went into the uh, reserves that we had. We had a reserve and we had a little bit of a cushion set aside for the reserve to adjust to the wind case and other challenges that we may see down the line. Well, we've exhausted all of that and so forth. And this year, uh, we went beyond what I recommended in terms, what I ultimately recommended in terms of tax increases. And, and that has a potential difficult problem for two reasons. One. Uh, given the level of tax increase that we've experienced now with additions from the council, it means that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to increase taxes any time in the foreseeable future. So you've taken revenue enhancement completely off the table in terms of a practical effect. You've exercised all of the other options like looking into the reserves. And what happens with the budget that you have and the increased expenditures, that budget, if you did nothing else to this budget, will increase substantially next year and you have very few of any options to resolve that. And so the budget that we have now will balance for this year, but it will throw us in a tremendous deficit potentially for next year with little or no option to address that. And the only recognizable option that we have right now will be, in fact, to substantially reduce the budget that we already have. So that's the problem. And that's for FY18. That's right, that's mm -hmm. for 18, and you can't get around that. So you can't look at budgets in one year. You have to look at them multiple years. And the actions that we've taken now really places us in a very difficult position. So I say, well, the increased expenditures, ongoing expenditures that we have in the budget, that does not even assume that you know we don't have challenges with snow and other emergencies, but just the budget as it is, assuming no increase 
or any other thing that we may add to that budget, we're already in a potential deficit with little or no uh, adjustments to be made for the future other than the cut. So what does it do for us going into the third and fourth year of the cycle where we potentially have to make major cuts to very good programs we have within our budget? And I'm sure this is something, is this something that County Council had a clear understanding of? I mean, considering the fact that no more property taxes increase in upcoming years and next year, FY18. Well, I'm not saying that they cannot increase property tax, but my point is that you've increased property tax fairly substantially this year. You've increased the recordation taxes also this year. Mm -hmm. The practical likelihood of your increasing that again next year is very remote when you have to assume that you have to have all nine members to sign off on taxes. That's, that's virtually not there. And I said that to them, and they proceeded to go ahead and anyway. So maybe they have an answer that uh, I'm not aware of, and let's wait and see what that may be. Let's see um, what that I that is. FY18, because you say budget here in Montgomery County, it's all the time. Even the FY17 is approved, uh, kicks in on the 1st of July. FY18, so it is a very uh, bad picture for the next operating Certainly. budget. Certainly, and when you see people who have increased taxes, and then you see the next year that you've substantially reduced in the budget, the question may be, why are we going through this roller coaster? And uh, my view had been, let's keep expenditures down, not only this year, but last year as well, because it has a cumulative effect. Do not add things into the budget that will have ongoing impacts to our budgets. And, and let's maintain a little bit more of a cushion in our reserves if we could to deal with the emergencies that we have down the line. And this increase in spending of the $27 million, where did it go? Well, they went to everything. Let me back up. There are no bad programs you can look at. So it's not a question, did you do something in terms of a program that was bad? I think all of the things that we have are very good programs. We added, for example, to the uh, uh, monies for the uh, uh, finance for elections, one thing. That's not a bad idea, but it's not the top priority for us. Uh, we've had additional other support for some of the ongoing programs for our most needed in the county. Those are good programs and some of the nonprofits in the county that are doing work along with the county. Those things are good to do, but you simply cannot afford it ongoing at the level that we've provided. We're going to take a short break, Mr. Leggett, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. This conversation continues with County Executive Ike Leggett. Swimming can be a great way to stay cool and beat the summer heat. Hi, I'm Gabe Albernaz, Director of the Montgomery County Recreation Department. And I'd like to ask you to be our partner in making this a safe summer. Drowning is a leading cause of accidental deaths in children, but drowning can be avoided. By following a few important rules, we can ensure that our children are safe at the pools. Regardless of swimming ability, children should never be unsupervised. Even with lifeguards, there is no substitution for adult supervision. Minimize distractions such as cell phones. Drowning can happen in minutes. If you have to leave the pool for any reason, you need to take your children with you. Inflatable swimming aids such as floaties and noodles are not life safety devices. Do not substitute these for supervision either. By working together, we can make sure we are all safe at the pool this summer. The next 30 seconds can save you a lot of money. Just do your laundry in cold and stick to full loads. Auto-sleep your computers. Plug your gadgets in a power strip and switch it off when you're done. Head it out, turn back your thermostat by 10 degrees. And drive sensibly. The more energy you save, the more money you save. Find other great tips at energysaver.gov.
Hello and welcome to this edition of 101 with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. We're talking about the budget. Uh, let's transition, Mr. Leggett, to the White Oak development. Viva White Oak. <laughs> <laughs> love the name. Got to love it. Yeah. Uh, moving forward with the vision of creating a local community in East County, uh, how is that going to happen? Well, let's back up and <laughs> understand why we're doing this. If you look in the East County, you'll find that in the East County, uh, we've not had the level of economic growth and development that we've seen in other areas throughout Montgomery County. Uh, there are generally uh, too few jobs that are in the area. The tax base has not increased. We do not have enough of the amenities that we will see in other portions of the county. Uh, we've visualized for a long period of time uh, some major development project that will allow us to make that transition. And this is what it is, the Viva White Oak uh, uh, transition. Uh, we're building on two pillars there. Uh, one is the FDA that is already there, and we hope they will continue to expand in the area. The other is the Venice Hospital that was groundbreaking just a couple of months ago. And now, of course, with the third piece with Viva White Oak. By adding in bus rapid transit along 29, it allows us to, in effect, build on some very good things that we think will occur here. But the difficulty for us had been to come to an agreement because this, this is a, there's a challenge here. And one of the things that I've said going back almost a year or so ago, if we apply the normal rules of, of land use development, uh, traffic mitigation patterns, and all the other things that we've applied in many other areas throughout the county, it would be very difficult for us to achieve that in that area. Uh, there's been a reason as to why for 30 years we've been not uh, been able to move forward on the projects here to get the kind of interest that we wanted. So we had to come up with a plan that was attractive to developers, a plan that, would, that was affordable, and one that we could, in fact, implement. I think, realistically, the one that we've signed with Picante, uh, the GDA that we have, is one that is implemental. It's one that would achieve the job long term for us. Uh, there were some very challenging, difficult negotiations that went on far longer than I'd anticipated. But when we finally looked at it, uh, recognizing that we had a very good partner on the other side, the Kudelski family, that had been a mainstay in Montgomery County, provided a great deal in terms of their philanthropic efforts in the county, worked on many major projects, recognizing on the other side that the county really wanted to come to some agreement, and knowing what the challenges we uh, we saw there and what would happen if we did not come to agreement. I think both of us looked at it and said, you know, let's give this another try, let's work at this harder, and we were able to come up with an agreement that I think will do the job for us long term. So as part of that agreement and moving forward, what is uh, the first thing, what is next? Well, one of the big things that we hope would be additional expansion of, of the uh, FDA there. Uh, clearly, it's an area that we look to for economic growth and development, essentially in biotechnology. Uh, we think that we have some good leads of firms and organizations that would like to expand there. We'll have greater housing, a better mix of housing that we've had in the East County, and hopefully the amenities of restaurants and other things that people come to enjoy. Uh, but we need to do this, and it will build substantially on our tax base, on the number of jobs long term, and will be a tremendous benefit for our county. Estimated number of jobs in, the, in that area? Well, you could be looking at somewhere in the with 10 or 12,000 jobs, but this is over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will take a while for us to build it out, but you have to start at some point. I think that we have a good starting uh, position. We have a good partner to work with. Uh, the community out there is excited about this, and so it gives us something to build on, and I'm very excited that uh, we've been able to come to this agreement. Let's talk about Metro mm -hmm. and uh, safe track surges how the county it's ready for long term in order to face uh, the disruptions that this is going to cause. And how much is this going to cost the county? Well, there's some mixed, and, uh, <laughs> mixed challenges here for us. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate the general manager of, of, of Metro, who has a huge job and recognize the top priority for us and for the residents and the users of Metro is, in fact, safety and reliability. And he's decided to, once and for all, tackle this issue which means that there may be some inconveniences for some of the riders of Metro, uh, challenges here and there, but we have to get this system fixed, and this is the best way to do it. Now, what that means for us in Montgomery County, uh, that we will have to provide some alternative uh, plans for transportation in areas where there may be disruption, bus services, more frequent bus services along the route, uh, given our residents some uh, levels of convenience where they would have inconvenience with the normal metro system to provide us with uh, bus services in that interim. It will cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars to uh, provide for the uh, plan that we've organized. For the, for the entire time. year? 
Yes. For, for there are two major segments that would occur here. But in, in Montgomery County. In Montgomery County along the red line. And it will uh, impact us to the tune of about a million dollars. And hopefully uh, this will not be something that will be repeated in the future. That is that we will have to tie down a line essentially for long periods of time. But I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, we apologize for the inconveniences that may occur, uh, but we need to tackle this in something that should have been done a long time ago. From MetroList transition to PEPCO and uh, the merger with Exelon that happened uh, a couple months ago, and the fact that you and uh, Prince George's County uh, Executive Russian Baker uh, just held recently a press event with the uh, President and CEO of PEPCO, kind of to highlight the benefits of this merger uh, to both counties, both jurisdictions. Remind us about reliability and that promise <laughs> from PEPCO, please. Well, first of all, let me congratulate uh, all the people involved in coming to this agreement. Certainly Prince George's County and Montgomery County played a very substantial part in making certain that the agreement happened. Uh, my biggest aim and objective was to see that we had a, uh, an agency that was able to have much more reliability reduce the amount of outages that we had. And when we had outages, those outages would be much short in terms of duration. That's the primary objective. And of course, to keep rates down at a level that would not impact us, our, our residents too severely. Now, for order for PEPCO to do that, uh, they had very little resources, in, in my opinion, when you look at it, for them to do all the things that we wanted them to do, to place underground some of the wires, to harden some of the uh, facilities that they had, to do all the trimming that was necessary, to bring in the additional crews when we had outages. By having this merger with Exelon, you were able now to build on the synergies of a much larger company, a corporation that will have resources up and down the entire East Coast that they can bring and leverage here when we have outages to help them financially to underpin them to do much of the work that, that we think is required. All of that goes to our uh, ability to have the reliability that we want. Now, in addition to that, uh, there are some additional items, but the first item is reliability, predictability for the system. And what we have from that is about $25 million that would go to Montgomery County residents over and above the, the amounts of money that we got, I think a $50 rebate to many of our residents as well. But another $25 million that we will be able to utilize in the area of energy efficiency. And I think that would work well for all of us. Well, hurricane and storm season started June 1st. Let's hope it doesn't get tested. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a short break, uh, Mr. Leggett, and we'll be right back. Looking for a way to get around downtown Silver Spring? Hop on the Route 28 Van Gogh Free Circulator. The Route 28 Van Gogh Free Circulator provides rides Monday through Thursday from 7 a.m. to midnight and Friday through Saturday from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. Fast, convenient, and free. There's no better way to get around downtown. To find out more information about the Route 28 Van Gogh Free Circulator, including route information, visit us online or dial 311. Are you sure they can recycle us, Clamshell? Hey, Dome, we're on a new recycling postcard. I can't wait to make a new start. Maybe I'll be a red carpet at a big premiere. And I'll get to paint the White House. Shh, here he comes. <laughs> now you can recycle more plastics in Montgomery County, including number one PET plastics, such as clamshells, Nelly containers, trays, lids, domes, and cups. Woohoo! We're in! For more information on recycling, contact the Montgomery County, Maryland Division of Solid Waste Services at 311. The wait is over. Recycle more plastics today. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making home affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Did you know there are more than 10,000 county government phone numbers? But there's only one number you need to remember for non-emergency calls, 311. MC311 is Montgomery County government's online telephone information system. Need information? Have a problem or complaint? Trying to locate a county government facility? Call 311. The call center is open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The website is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.
Welcome back to 101 with Montgomery County Executive Act Leggett. I'm Lauren Overjilly. Uh, Mr. Leggett, SICA prevention in, in the county. Uh, a couple of um, town hall meetings have been hosted and county residents have actually come out in force to get informed about the Zika virus and prevention. There's one component involves the state, which is spraying. Some people want it, some people don't. And the county obviously is informing our residents. Prevention versus spraying. Well, there may be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the severity of the problem, uh, the challenges that we face. Uh, the first area to tackle certainly would be uh, prevention. Uh, that is to find ways in order to ensure that you and your family are protected. And we have an online site in our Zika. If you go 311 and ask for additional information on the Montgomery County website, you can get additional information on how to better protect yourself. Part of that would be using some type of protection on your arms and legs and necks, wearing appropriate clothing, and making certain when you go outside, uh, draining certain ponds or places where water will con congregate to ensure that you do all that is necessary to in terms of personal prevention for yourself and your family. The question of spraying is something that is still out there. Uh, it may be necessary down the line. There are no uh, immediate conclusions about that at this particular time. Uh, but it is possible that we could have that down the line. Hopefully we may not uh, because we can uh, prevent much of what would happen by the individual suggestion I've already given. But keep in mind that we have in this area a very transient population with large numbers of people who go to Central and, and uh, South America constantly. They're in and out of the area. And as a result of that, uh, we have to be aware of those people over a period of time uh, may be coming in contact with uh, communities uh, that may in fact be much more heavily involved with, with the Zika virus. So there is some warning from Montgomery County and for our residents and I hope that people will take the precautions and take this seriously and to be properly informed and know what to do in order to reduce the potential impact. Yeah, and for information, you did mention that website, which is uh, our website, montgomerycountymd.gov slash mosquito. Uh, just in time, the new Dennis Avenue Health Center open doors, 55,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility. Really wonderful. I visited it uh, for the ribbon cutting. And uh, what are some of the services that are going to be offered there, Mr. Leggett? Well, first of all, it's the services for our residents that are impacted by a variety of things in Montgomery County. Uh, when you go back three years ago and we had the, the challenges with AIDS, our center provided a great deal of support for people who were impacted and trying to provide them with resources to be helpful. Uh, we look at uh, some of the challenges we have with the Zika virus. Uh, they are very helpful in making certain uh, that people have the necessary equipment. Uh, people who have many concerns about their own individual personal health uh, can go there for resources and help and support. Uh, overall, it continues to be a, a county community health clinic providing services in terms of prevention, services in terms of providing them with the necessary appropriate care that they need to a certain level that will help them in terms of their individual health. It provides a broad array of services in a location that is, I think, is idea and something that I think we can build on because the facilities that we had in the past simply were not adequate for a population of the size that we now have in Montgomery County. From the 60s, yes. and it will be yeah. demolished. That's right. <laughs> and um, 2000 Dennis Avenue is the location in Silver Spring for the new health clinic. Let's talk about homelessness and the fact that the, this year, the time survey showed a, a decrease of 11% of homelessness individual in the county. Is this due to services enhancement? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I think uh, it's services enhancement, uh, support and the change in the economy. Uh, when we had at the height of the recession, the very difficult challenges in the, with the recession, I think many people who ordinarily would not find themselves uh, lack of homelessness fell into that category. So the combination of the services that are provided, the change in the economy, I think helped us to reduce the numbers. But 11% sounds great, but it's a one-year target, one-year number, uh, but the target should be zero, and that's what we're trying to achieve. But we cannot do that if we do not prevent sustainable programs ongoing, try to prevent homelessness in the first place, uh, rather than to, in effect, try to provide the services and support when people are falling into that category. The best way to prevent and decrease homelessness is to prevent people from getting into the, into the challenge to begin with. 
Let's transition now to the elder uh, community in the county, which is increasing. Um, recently, the annual Senior Safety Forum took place. Basically, it was focused a little bit more uh, on how to be safe in the use of technology. But uh, is there a concern that scams and crimes and abuses against seniors is in the increase in Montgomery County? Well, first of all, recognize that we have a very large elder population in Montgomery County. Well, I'm considered elder already <laughs> in Montgomery County. <laughs> they got their 55 year elder yeah, in Montgomery right. County. Well, the, that number is increasing, and we probably have 20 percent fairly quickly. If you look around the region, Montgomery County has one of the oldest population in the entire region. So the services and the challenges that are needed in order to address the abuse to seniors run the gamut. Uh, and one of the ones that have now become much more apparent is the use of technology. Uh, as you may recall, many of our seniors did not have the availability of technology when they were in school or in their job employments when they worked many years ago. Now they are becoming much more accustomed to the use of technology. And they are not as familiar with the technologies as they need to be. And therefore, they can fall victim to scams, uh, victims not only from those who are in your immediate community, but people literally all over the world. And so our seniors need to be aware of some of the precautions they need to take in order to prevent some of the challenges they face as it relates to technology. But there are a number of other challenges as well. Uh, many of the challenge, unfortunately, comes from people within their own, own home, their own community. Uh, anywhere from physical abuse to verbal abuse, uh, to taking advantage of them financially across the board. All kinds of scams that you can think of, there are people out there who are trying it, and they prey on the elderly. And so our programs and services in the Elder Abuse Awareness Day is designed to bring together the latest information to make certain that seniors are aware, and then we continue down this road to protect our seniors who are unfortunately uh, too vulnerable to some of the scams and some of the people that are out there. And they have some very, very good people who are committing these crimes against our elderly, and we have to be careful and try to get ahead of them. We have just about a minute left. Sure. Uh, summertime. Yeah. The pool's open, Memorial yeah. Day weekend, and the Department of Recreation has been pushing a lot for water safety. Mm -hmm. Please send a message again about water safety to our county residents, not only in our pools, but in Chesapeake Bay and around the Potomac. Well, once again, we are up and ready in Montgomery County. We provide what I think is a first-rate service for our seniors at our pools. But uh, one of the things that we need cooperation and support from is to help us in the safety areas. And all, far too often, there are families who utilize the pools, who go, who are not aware, do not recognize the dangers they're about, uh, not being attentive to young people so that you should make certain you provide all the warnings if you're there. Uh, do not get, become distracted with the telephones, with, with the a reading material and you have young people to buy, have someone watching them at all times. I remember those days when yes. my son was little. <laughs> I remember those days. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Liggett, and thank you for watching. Any more information, do remember to visit the website, MontgomeryCountyMD.gov. I'm Lorna Virgili. Have a great day. In Montgomery County, we have a goal to reduce waste and recycle 70% of all waste by 2020. By recycling and reducing waste, we save natural resources and make our community even better. So recycle at home, work, school, everywhere, and keep recycling going. For more information, call the Montgomery County, Maryland Division of Solid Waste Services at 311 or visit montgomerycountymd.gov recycling. Keep it going. Recycle more now. A Zika virus prevention tip from the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Mosquitoes can exploit the tiniest pools of standing water in your yard and ruin your summer fun. Check your yard every week and dump water out of any containers you see. Buckets, cans, bottles, coolers, bird baths, even wheelbarrows and especially saucers under flower pots. Store items upside down when not in use or better yet inside. Learn more at mda.maryland.gov slash Zika.
There's a reason why area law enforcement are out enforcing pedestrian and traffic safety laws and preventing killer pedestrian crashes. Be alert. Be street smart. 